thank you for having me back. Last, last time I, I actually had some anxiety this morning because last time I spoke was here on May 24th. Uh, and I already apologize in advance. Some of you guys come up and we made uh, digs to get together and talk and counsel, but I didn't know that two days later I'd be going into Desert Sand for a colonoscopy and not coming out for 12 days and uh, minus about 48 pounds. Like I looked a lot better right now. I've gained 12. I've moved up from Holocaust survivor to Sudanese refugee camp look. So I'm <laughs> feeling good about that right now. Uh, my wife, who uh, said the other day, hey, come here, it looks like you have a couple of screens hanging from your box. She goes, oh no, those are your legs. I'm like, well, that's <laughs> 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 so a little self-conscious. For some of you guys that I you made deals, uh, come up and see me. Uh, the oncologist told me to go and have my get get back to the most normal kind of life. So they took out a cancerous tumor, plus forty-eight pounds. Started chemo a month or so ago, and uh, just took my chemo pills out there. So. I was a little nervous about that because it usually is accompanied by brain fog. So if I repeat myself, um, just know where that's coming from. Uh, but I'm excited to do this because I was sitting, I was sitting by this week and uh, feeling a little anxiety, which I never do. I love, I, I miss this, and uh, thinking of a way to back out because I knew Bobby's out of town and so he couldn't get mad at me until he gets back. And God just said, um, "No, you're going to do what you're called to do." And uh, you're going to have the most normal life you can, and you may see the most fruitful time in all your ministry. And so I'm actually excited. And thank you guys for, for the guys who prayed. Some of you guys checked in with me. You don't know how much that means. I, I went off the grid on purpose, um, but I, I still read all your text. So I said all that. Uh, that doesn't count on my time, buddy. So I just wanted to say that. It's interesting, you know, LJ was all excited to say, uh, hey, can you guys all move in? I was salivating because I was a pastor for. 17 years, and I wanted to stand up here and say, hey, shut up, we're getting ready to start. I wanted to do that. And so I understand that excitement when you get, get the power of the microphone. It's fun. It was interesting. Uh, I love watching you guys do this because John, John Wimber is, is becoming one of my favorite, even though he's passed away 20 years ago. He's a pastor who got it. I mean, you guys are up here, just your testimony of sharing the word. Like, you could almost take an offering and go home right now with some of you guys. And John Wimber used to say, Everyone gets to play. You know, we've created a church culture where you have the superstar celebrity speaker and, and then and the uh, traveling uh, worship band, and then everybody else, or audience. And I love seeing everybody gets to play. So that's it's really encouraging to my country. So Bobby said, share with them what God's been teaching you, and uh, I'll probably end that way. In fact, I'm going to kind of reverse engineer this, which is a very sneaky way of guaranteeing that I get another time back. So I'm going to give you the end and then go back to the beginning and uh, very cleverly book myself in and come back again to, to share. But it's I've heard it four or five times already, and uh, I've been reintroduced to the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, unfortunately... That seems to have gone by the wayside lately, and I want to enter. I want to kind of reintroduce to you who's been introduced to me. Um, you know, 1972, I think it was. Something happened in Upper State, Massachusetts, that changed the way municipalities do uh, their business. I've never been in the uh, in the Northeast, but they have these things called nor'easters. Anybody from there that you know that like copious amounts of snow, terrible freezing, and uh, it was upstate Massachusetts. And this lady had come out of her house for a couple of days. The neighbors checked on her, and she had froze to death in her house. She didn't pay her electric or her gas bill, and she froze to death. So now, in times of acts of God, you know they won't shut your power off. The sad part is when they start checking in to her, what they found is she was worth one point two million dollars. Like, what a shame to have all those resources at the tip of your finger and then check out of this planet with the appearance of being broke or bankrupt. <laughs> I'm afraid there's a lot of guys that are going to end up like that when it comes to the resource that the Holy Spirit gives us. So this came about in a couple of ways. Number one is uh, I'm writing my second book, and it's called New Breed Man, Tapping Into a Spirit-Filled Masculinity. Uh, it's different than a regular masculinity. It's a spirit-filled masculinity. So I wanted to share a little bit as I've been studying that. That came. And then uh, you, got, you got the slides of the verses? <laughs> Acts chapter 2, I was reading this, 
I mean, you don't have to be a peripheral viewer of the news to realize we're at unprecedented, unparalleled times. And if you're even just a drive-by a viewer of eschatology or end time things, it, it'll make you pick up and uh, take notice. And he says in Acts chapter 2, that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. So I'm like, now what does that look like? Not that I'm, I'm not, I'm not dribbling it out. I'm not sprinkling it out. I'm pouring it out. And then I came across Mark 16, which is Mark's, um, really his great commission. In Matthew 28, he said, you know, you're going to go out and make disciples. Mark says the same thing. But then he says this. He says, that these are the ones that believe. And so how do you know the ones that are going out believers? They will, and, and I'm no longer a cessationist, which that's just another fancy theological word for those who believe the gifts of the Spirit died when the apostles died. You have to get rid of big hunts of the Old Testament and church history uh, to not see that in every generation there was phenomenological evidence that the Spirit of God was powerful and at work. So he says, these are the signs that those believe. They will cast out demons. They will touch the sick and they'll be healed. They will, uh, if they drink poison, they won't be harmed by it. But, which, by the way, I was reading that verse in the morning at my first chemo. And I said, God, they're getting ready to put poison in my body today. And I'm going to claim this verse. And so two treatments down, praise the Lord, haven't had one bit of sickness. Uh, that's a God thing. So then I started to think, so it's a little different than Matthew, where he gives just a great commission. So there's more than just a proclamation. There needs to be a demonstrated reality of your salvation. A demonstrated reality. So that's Mark chapter 16. So maybe depending on how you grew up, what your worldview was about the Holy Spirit, some people who really aren't aware of it, they say, oh yeah, cool, I'm going to hear about the Holy Spirit. I don't know much about it. Those who grew up uh, like me, militant fundamental Baptist, which is a very attractive term, uh, and very welcoming, and were afraid of the Holy Spirit. Because if you got too close to him, he'd make you do weird stuff in no different places. And so I started I started on this journey even before I got sick, and then it's only it's only ramped up since then. And, and just because people have misused what the Holy Spirit's like, like I remember when I first moved to Arizona, uh, I was 16, uh, 19, well, if I tell you what year, you know how old I am. Uh, I went to a, a, it was kind of during the end of the Jesus movement, we went to a small church with my friend's dad because he heard that they were uh, Pentecostal and he wanted to experience that. So my first my first time there, I'm sitting and a guy stands up two seats from me and he says, Thus say the Lord in the power of the Spirit. And then he starts talking in tongues. And I'm looking at him, I've never seen that before. He sits down. The guy on the other side stands up and says, I'm going to interpret what he has to say. Here's what the Spirit of God says by the power of the Lord. And then he interpreted what this guy said. Now I probably wouldn't remember if it remember this 40 years post if it wasn't so funny, because after he sat down, this guy stands up again and said, that is not what I said. <laughs> like, so is that really the Holy Spirit, or it is, is it, you know? And then I was talking to a, a Pentecostal pastor from Plano, Texas, he said he'd, he'd have open times, and um, they were talking about moving to church, and some guy stood up in the front row and said, thus said the Lord, the power of the Spirit, was not I the one who gave Abraham the keys to bring Israelites out of Egypt, and will I not do that with this church? And then he sat down, and then he said, I saw his wife say, it wasn't Abraham, it was Moses. So then he stands up and says, thus say the Lord, the power of the Spirit, I was wrong. <laughs> it was Moses, not, and I'm thinking, really, is that the Holy Spirit? I'm like, if anybody's going to be good at Bible trivia, it's going to be the Holy Spirit, right? Because he would know <laughs> if it's Moses or is it Abraham. And so you start to ask questions like, is this really the Holy Spirit? Is that really what that is? And I, I shied away from it so much. I mean, I knew he was um, the third part of the Trinity. I didn't know that he was as active and powerful as he was. And so you get to the scene and... and uh, I didn't put that up there. You get to the scene in John chapter 3, you know, the most famous verse, John 3, 16. But 1 through 7, you see Nicodemus. He's a, he's a scholar. He's a Pharisee. He's one of the best teachers around. And he meets Jesus. That's that interaction, which I thought was really captured very well in the series of Chosen, if you've watched that, where he says, you know, should I again, need to be born again? Do I have to go into my mother's womb? And then Jesus said this. You shouldn't be surprised that I say that because... What's born of the flesh is flesh, and what's born of the spirit is spirit. 
The wind blows wherever it goes. You don't know where it's coming from and you don't know where it's going, such as the Spirit of God. But if you've been in ministry at all, or if you've been a volunteer, you've seen that happen. I, I think he tells us that to let us know that the Holy Spirit's not a it's not an app, it's not a tool. He's a person. And, and we don't find a way how to harness him so we can use him. The idea is to, not to use him, to be used by him. And so in that, uh, he says, you can't tell where the where the, the wind blows. Thus is the spirit. I remember going down to, my, my parents used to love to go down to San Diego. And I remember we'd go to this little inlet. And, and oh, this was maybe 15 years ago. And I was watching them uh, teach people how to windsurf. And you could tell the experts from uh, from the beginners, not because of the equipment difference or any kind of uniform, is that these guys knew how to position themselves to get the wind, and and, and that that's what the Holy Spirit. The word in New Testament is pneuma, breath, spirit, wind. They knew how to position themselves to where this the wind would take the sail and move it. And that's what I'm like. Okay. Holy Spirit, we, we got to get together here. This is what I need. This is what I need. So Philip Yancey, I don't know if you read any of his books. He went to pretty conservative school, and he said there was to be a sign on the wall. He said probably facetiously, but what to do in cases of emergency with Bible college. And what was defined as emergencies were tornado, earthquake, flood, and charismatic activity. Now, I don't know if, that's, if that would be consistent with an with a, a emergency. But this is kind of how we looked at things, and this is how judgmental I was. And I realized I wasn't tapping in to a spirit-filled masculinity. I wasn't tapping into a spirit-filled anything, to be honest with you. So how do we do that? I mean, he, he's a, it's a mystery. And, and I don't, I'm not here to, to demystify the Holy Spirit because we need to be in awe. We don't understand a lot of things. But we position ourselves to be used by him. So there's a lot of things we can do. And there's a lot of things we can't do. And then I'm going to end with uh, some things he wants to do in you and the things he wants to do with you. So one of them is, it says in Ephesians 4, 30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve. Certainly, half of this room, if not all of this room, are going to do something, think something, or say something that may grieve the Holy Spirit today, myself included. And when you do that, the idea is not to run away and separate yourself until you can clean up your act and go back. That, that just totally exacerbates the situation. He still wants you to come. Come to him. But you know, from, early, from early childhood, we've been taught how to numb out the voice. You know, that little voice, that little small voice. I remember my son, we lived in Mesa, and we had those old fences with the big spots that slide them in and those things. And we had a monsoon come by and it ripped our back wall. And my son was maybe dying and I went out there, he was standing on top, getting ready to jump. I knew because he had his towel on, which was his cape, and he was going to jump. I'm like, get it, go! And he jumped, he hit the yard, he rolled, he gets up. He was, fine. he was fine. So I turned around to tell his mother what her son was doing, and he he climbed back up on again. I'm like, get it, no! And he jumped, hit the ground, did a roll, and I went up to him, like, what are you, what are you doing? So I'm your dad, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you the first time. <laughs> it probably went brilliant for Bill. Let's just be honest. Okay, I got to give him an A for that. And I said, "How did you know there was? Uh, if, how did you know there was the first time?" He said, "Lucky guess." <laughs> Again, brilliant, brilliant. But we've been trained. We've been trained from an early age to kind of to to let that that feeling. And you've done, we've all done it. I mean, I hear it all the time working with guys. You know that. I know I shouldn't press enter on this website I typed in. I know I'm not, so I'm telling me not to click. You know, that, that still small voice is we've already learned how to numb that out. And you can't access the power of the Holy Spirit when you, when you grieve him. And again, the idea is you don't feel like running to him when you grieve him. But that's what he wants to do. Then in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, uh, don't quench the spirit. Just three three words in that verse. Don't quench the spirit. That should be four, but I've not been good at math for a long time. Don't quench the spirit. Quench means to put out a fire, to, to swell something. Like there's times when God says something to you, and uh, you know you ought to act on it. I remember I was I was I may or may not have been pulled over by one of Gilbert's finest, and when I was reaching in for my information, I had a, a card fall out. 
And, it was, and I remember thinking, oh man, I haven't talked to him in a long time. I need to give him a call. That was my thought. And then I haven't talked to him for so long, but what would I say? And I just put it away. A couple of days later, I run into a friend. He goes, hey, you heard what going on with Michael? His wife left him last week. Not that it would have made a difference if I called, but I should have called. It might have been a great time. I, did, I, I felt the nudge and I quenched it. Listen, you can't access the power of the Spirit when we do that. And, and he won. I, I'm sitting in my chair. At, uh, I still, it's been, well, I've been out of the hospital since June 1st, and I still haven't slept in bed. I still sleep in a recliner, uh, which doesn't seem to bother my wife, which is problematic for me, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'll get back in at, all, at any point on, on the spectrum. But I have some good morning times, and, and I let the Holy Spirit, in fact, if I, if I don't go too long, um, I didn't press my camera, if I don't go too long, I was going to give you a little, um, a hint on how you can access him in the morning. I do a little uh, soaking in the spirit, just meditation, and I let him talk to me. And, and we have to believe, that's what I love about prayer time, we have to believe that communication God is more than me just talking to him. It's his desire to talk to me. And, and if I'm not listening or haven't been trained to listen, or actually, if I've been trained to push him away, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss out on a lot. So he says, don't, don't quench that spirit. I guarantee sometime this week uh, he's going to prompt you to do something. There was a there was a great uh, Dallas Willard was speaking. He's a great author. I don't even know if he's still alive. To be honest with you, but he was telling the story how he told God, "I'm going to listen to you talk. I'm going to listen when you talk. I'm going to obey you when you talk." So he was speaking at a men's conference. He goes, "I'm standing up on stage and I'm looking at this guy and the Holy Spirit kind of told him, go down and talk to that guy. He's having a problem." So he's like. Uh, okay, I said I'd be obedient. He walked down and talked to guys. He said, listen, I, this sounds weird. I know there's like you know, 1,300 guys in this room. God kind of told me you had a problem. He goes, no, I'm fine. He goes, no, are you sure? He goes, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, no, I think you have a problem. God said you have a problem. He goes, no, I'm fine. <laughs> so he turned back. He's walked up the stage. He's like, wait a minute, God. Wait, who embarrassed me? He goes, I'm like two more minutes into it. God said, go back down to the beginning. He's got a problem. He so walked down. You could tell he was getting super frustrated. And then he broke. He said, yeah, actually, uh, I do have a problem. I'm a pastor at one of the churches. My guys are back there. And when I get home, I'm quitting. The church can't, fac can't facilitate my salary. My son's got to go to the hospital, and I, I owe $5,200, or I can't even take him to the hospital. They start to cry, and they're praying for him. Uh, it sounds like a practice group, actually, there, that thing, because he, while they were praying, the guys were stirring around in the back. They were prompted. And when they finished praying, the guy walked down and said, hey, those guys in the back, we made six grand, here you go, and handed it to them. Because, A, they were prompted by the Spirit, and B, the pastor was willing to take a risk. It's a, it's a risky thing to listen to the Holy Spirit, because you'll, you'll fail more than you don't. Uh, one of my friends who grew up with Wimber in the vineyard movement, um, he, he gets these words of knowledge. And I, I used to laugh at stuff like that when I was a fundamental Baptist. Okay. And we were sitting in Panera, and there's four of us, and and I'm watching him watch this couple. I'm listening to this guy talk, but I'm watching him watch this couple walk in. And he's eating while he's watching them, and that's never good. And then he says, hey, I'll be right back. God really gave me something to tell this couple. So it was so... It was farther than back of this room. We couldn't hear the conversation, but he went over to this really big guy with his cute little girlfriend or wife and said, you might think I'm crazy, but God just gave me a word for you. And uh, you promised him, he looked at the guy, you promised him that if he made you successful, you would give your life to him. God's done his part, and you didn't do yours. All we heard at our table was a scream because the girl said, he just told me that in the car. So he looks at us, he goes, you guys, you guys can go. And so we're walking out. This guy said, have you ever noticed God speaks to him when it's his turn to pay the tab? I'm like, I've noticed the pattern. I've noticed the pattern. Uh, that's going to sense humor that way, too. But not only, not only does he not want you to quench him or to grieve him, there's certain things that he's prompting you to do. I'm gonna, let me tell you, there's guys in this room right now, you forget being a table leader, you ought to be a, you ought to be a home group leader. Somebody here, somebody here needs to uh, listen to the, the prompting of God and know, maybe get into a ministry of some kind. Maybe you're, you know what, maybe you're a bit, I, I see this a lot, maybe you're a businessman who highly successful, you even feel guilty about that. I would hope that you would be prompted 
by God to fan the flame of your gifts and you go out and make a billion dollars and not wealth money, but funnel it into the kingdom of God. I hope you listen to the prompts of God because he so desperately wants to use you. And in Acts chapter 2, there were guys who were willing to lay down their lives for this to happen. And I'm like, where is that now? Where are the guys full of the spirit now who lay down their life? Did God change the way he deals with us? Does he not uh, think we're capable of being like a first century church kind of guy? No, he's a, it's the exact same thing. In fact, if you look hard enough, you'll see it happen. And when you see guys laying down their life, uh, and by life, it could be physical life or just uh, your desires, your dreams. When you see guys laying down their life for the gospel, you'll see the Holy Spirit is in charge and in power. So he doesn't want you to grieve him, and he doesn't want you to quench the, the gift that he's given you. But he also wants to do some things with you. And he's there for a purpose. So he wants to do stuff in you and then you. Genesis chapter 1. So, yeah. Part. Contrary to popular belief, the Holy Spirit isn't a late character into the Bible. He didn't show up in the New Testament. He was there in Genesis chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and there was, uh, he hovered over the, uh, the emptiness and the darkness and the, and the uh, void. The word in, Greek, in uh, Hebrew is tohu tabohu. He hovered over the darkness. The creation had not happened yet. And let me tell you, as what happens in the creation narrative, cosmically, it can happen uh, in an individual way. Some of you guys are in a dark moment right now. I don't know why, but, you know, if you look at Genesis 2, 1, verse 2, Holy Spirit does his best work in the dark. He's willing to come in and shine light on whatever that problem is. And then it says there, it, it was uh, unformed. People say chaos. Oh, it's, it was chaos. God's not the author of chaos, but there was no, there was, it was so ununiformed, no, no two dots hooked together. That might sound like your life. It sounds like my home when I go there. Uh, sometimes it seems to be out of control, and the Holy Spirit so desperately, desperately, desperately wants to come in and start connecting those dots. Then it says he he was he hovered over, he tohu bahohu over the emptiness. There's a there's a void. You, you don't have to go too far from this room. And in the culture we live in, in the scenarios that we're living today, there are such people have this emptiness, which translates into hopelessness. And uh, we'll touch on that at the end because I think that's important. I think it's important that we not only find out what he wants to do with us, but he wants, what he wants to do with us and through us. So he says, uh, the Holy Spirit was there doing that work and he's doing it now. And so I'm, I'm wrestling with this because you have to know what uh, I, I'm proficient in uh, arguing both sides of an argument until I don't know what I believe. And so I'm listening to other people. I have a friend who, who says, you know, I pray three hours a day. And I'm like, you know, I tried it. I can't do it. Yeah, I, all, all, I tried it. My mind wanders. Uh, all I found out about myself is that I'm more than capable of falling asleep in several different positions. That's all I've learned about myself. Uh, that's so I tried that, but I, I'm wrestling with 40 years of a certain kind of theology that I grasped onto that left the Holy Spirit at arm's length. And, and once he starts to reveal himself in power, let me tell you, uh, so I've never had this last three months, I've never had more fun in my faith. Never had more fun. Never felt more alive. Never felt more used. And I, and I just don't want that for me. I, I'm a, I want this for you. I want you to understand this. So in Genesis chapter 2, you see a really interesting side where the Bible says he, he made Adam from the dirt. I mean, and you have to, if you struggle, if you struggle with God's viewpoint of view, in fact, most people do. They struggle, their biggest struggle is God, their view of God's view of them. That's, used, that's most people's problem. So if you're wondering, am I lovable? Can I let me let me tell you this verse in two seven? He creates Adam from the dust. It's a very the text implies it's a very intimate scene because he breathes life, breathes life. That that word is real. I think it's just the equivalent of pneuma in the breath, wind, spirit, and it, it's very intimate, face to face, mouth to mouth, lips to lips. Can't get more into it than that. And he breathes life into man. So the, I always I always befuddle myself because I ask myself a lot of questions. I try to ask myself questions I can't answer because that forces me to study. 
So how does God do that now? How, how does God breathe life now? Let me tell you. He brings life through you and me. We go to him and we get filled up and then we go on and we exhale that and then we come back for more. Uh, we started a ministry uh, a few years ago. I got a couple of guys here. It's called Breathing Lives International. In fact, some of the guys in practice, you did a camp with us like five years ago. We did a camp at, with Breathing Life. And I love that term because he breathes life into us and then we're to breathe it. We're to breathe it back. I'll tell you, people need that. I'm working with an intern. I do some counseling with him at a church uh, who's a pastor, a friend. And he let, the, he let the intern speak a couple Sundays ago. And it was, it was average at best. First time I told him, you know, man, if, if, you, could, if you could find some of my old eight tracks of my first ones, they used it actually for, for people who suck down poison to induce vomiting. That's what they used my first few messages for. And, and I saw the pastor walk up to him and said, you did great. And you could tell the kid's face that he didn't believe that. And then the pastor looked and said, I am so proud of you. I'm so honored that you are my intern and you're on my staff. And the look in that kid's face, and he breathed life into him. What a gift. Again, we're so selfish and we're walking around like, give me life, breathe life into me. Uh, that's kind of how I, I, I found myself praying to this. Like, man, I, I, I pray so self-centeredly. Uh, and when I when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, he, he flips the switch and then you start looking out. So I'm wondering who you guys breathe life into. Yeah, just in, in the two areas immediately. As a dad, you got kids, you got a son. You got a son who needs to be uh, affirmed in his masculinity because he's not getting it out there. You breathe life in him, or, or the most awkward, awkward relationship of them all is um, uh, a dad and his teenage daughter. You breathe life into her because if you're not, someone's going to. If you're not, some over testosterone, pimple face, burger flipper is going to come by. And try to tell her, try to breathe life into her and say he loves her and he has no right to do that and he doesn't even know what he means because he doesn't even understand what that is. And she lives in an over sexualized culture where even her, her own sexual identity is being challenged more for girls than guys, actually. You'd be surprised. It'd be nice, it would be nice if dad could breathe some life into her. And, and it's impossible to breathe life when you're empty. So you, you go to him and you're like, uh, so in my moments in the morning, I sit there and I, I'm quiet and I listen to some contemplative worship, more, not singing, but more just instrumental. And I just, I focus my mind and I'm like, you know, Holy Spirit, help me. I'm trying to love Jesus. Just help me love him. And then he starts to talk. I get filled. And then my I, my goal is not to just to get filled and walk outside. It's to, it's to be a conduit. How can I exhaust, exhale? When you bring them in. What about what about your marriage? I do an awful lot of marriage counseling. I uh, don't know how much more I want to do because it's frustrating at times. But who's bringing life into your life? Because if you're not, someone is. And you're like, yeah, but it's so hard. Listen, let me tell you one. Let me give you one hint. If you could give up your right to be right and just breathe life into her, you're going to change your marriage. And that was so freaking brilliant and profound i'm going to say it again if you can give up your right to be right and breathe life into her you're going to watch god change her and change you who bringing life uh we can't always just be on the receptive end so in this uh, and we do have some questions and i don't I, I was asking lj i don't know what you want to do you can't get your you can't get your buddies and your partners so you may there's some questions i'd love you to go through in, in the table time so you might just have to turn your chairs around and whoever the first four or five guys because I think it's important that you not only go through the questions, but you might write them down and ask yourself these questions every day uh, for a week because it's a good litmus test of where you're at and a, and a good uh, tracker of um, uh, the progress you've made. So when I'm looking at this, I'm like, all right, God, what do you have for me? What do you have for me? I don't like the situation I'm in. Um, the prognosis is actually better now than it was when I had it. 
And I'm like, so what, how am I going to end? How am I going to end? And then my wife hates this kind of talk. She's like, you're only 65. And I realize that I feel quite older, and apparently I have two stringy legs, so you have no, I can't talk to you. Uh, how do I get filled, and how do I, how do I do that? So, I, be, I believe for me, Bobby said, can you, could you sum up what God has taught you? And let me tell you what I've found. I shared it last night with the little Friday night home group church that we kind of just started and kind of fun. By the way, there's a lot of that happening as people kind of get frustrated with the organizational church and what some realness. But I told them this. God is easy to please, but he's almost impossible to satisfy. Let me tell you what I mean. As, as I search for him and I and I want community with him and intimacy with him and when I when I love him and love others, he's so so pleased with me. But at that same time, he's insatiably hungry for more. He wants more. And, and not as a heavy taskmaster, he doesn't want more from me, he wants more for me. And, and when I realized that, I, was, I remember sitting in that chair that like I'm gonna that that chair like I'll I'll keep that chair two years after my wife's gone because that's been an important chair for me. Uh, and if that gets out, I know where it came from, so I would let her know that. When I realized that he wants all this for me, because you know what he knows, he also knows my proclivity to go slow, to stall out. To get comfortable and sometimes even quit. So he presses and he presses and he's unsatisfied with my slowness, not, be, not because of anything I'm doing wrong, because he understands what it's like to be the, the amazing gift he's given us to be full of the Spirit of God and live a power packed, spirit filled life. You know, it'd really be a shame, really be a shame if some of you guys heard this today. And realized the treasures you have at your fingertips, but check out of this planet with all the appearances of being spiritually broken and bankrupt. Because it it's here and he's here and he's real. So I was a I was a fundamental Baptist, and um, which is about two goose steps short of a Nazi, if you just want if you're trying to get some kind of perspective on where I grew up. Um, and, and I'm not even kidding, honestly. I'm not even kidding. I was, I was telling the guys a story last night. Uh, we, you know, women couldn't wear, couldn't wear pants, and my wife didn't go to college. So she, I, had a, I had a powdered blue, 71 powdered blue Pinto. Anybody remember the Pintos? Oh, yeah. yeah. Powdered blue, too. That was a little masculine. And she came to pick me up to school, and she got out of the car, and she walked around. And then I got in the car and left. So the next day I show up to school, the dean calls me in. And gives me 25 demerits. I'm like, why? He said, because your wife is wearing pants. I said, my wife doesn't go to school. He goes, yeah, but you do. And my first thought was, I deserve 25 demerit for driving a powder blue pinto, but not because my wife wore pants. And so this kind of mindset that I grew up in tweaked my view of who Holy Spirit was. In fact, one of the guys in our group, I, I listened to them talk, and I, and I noticed something different. They would always say, Holy Spirit told me, and Holy Spirit said this. Instead of the Holy Spirit, and if you're if you're uh, good in English grammar, you know the is just the article that describes the object, and he's more than an object. He wants to be intricately intricate. He wants to be really involved in your life. <laughs> <laughs> brain fog, brain fog. Uh, give me brain fog alert. So when you do uh, when you do your table time or your your question time, I want you to. The first question was the easiest one to write, probably the hardest one to answer, because it really is going to go back and check your worldview, how you, how you grew up, and what your you know your, your view of the Holy Spirit was. If he was if he was scary or if he was uh, non-existent. But in this last days, which I, I get those questions all the time, you know, I'll get a, get a text from a client, a uh, counseling client, or late at night. Do you think we're in the end times? I'm like, hey, it's ten o'clock, and you're in the end times right now. So. Uh, 
Uh, we've been in the end times since 1967, 68. How, how do you like that? Or for, actually from 47 and 48. And now we're just, we're heading to the end, toward the end. And if his word is true as it is, he says, in these last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. And I don't know about you, but I, I want a big dose of that. I want to be a part of that. I want to know that, I want to know what it feels like to really be engulfed in that. So I was slightly anxious to come here. Just to, this is my this is my first time back now. Now I got a bunch of schedule, but uh, this is a good place to to cut your teeth too because you got leaders to tell you to shut up. And so this is not this is an irreverent place, which is right at home. But in this, so I'm driving here. I'm driving early. I've got a couple guys over days, and I'm like, all right, Holy Spirit, you got to be you got to be real today for me. You have to be real because I don't even know if I can do this anymore. I was questioning everything. And and I got to tell you, pulled up in this parking lot, uh, said a quick little one, and I could feel I could feel the power of his spirit. Now, uh, a part two of this will be what do you do with what do you do with some of the, the gifts of the spirit? You all, you all have gifts, every one of you, that he so wants to activate. And by the way, the Holy Spirit has already been in you. The day you were saved. The Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1 tells us, came in you and sealed you to the day of redemption. So it's not like you're trying to call him down. You're trying to call him out because he's there. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with you. So as I, as I sat there in my chair waiting last night, I've been up since 2 o'clock because I'm like half excited and half anxious to be here. I'm, I I started to do what I do. I want to teach you a little trick before we're done here. It's like, how do I... How do I access that? So in these moments in the morning, uh, I, I call it two-way journaling. I do a two-way journal. Because again, I have to believe that my relationship with God is more than me just complaining to him and trying not to fall asleep when I pray. That he, he's actually talking back. So in this two-way journaling, I, you, you got to write it down. I have a little journal there, and I listen to this music to just comfort myself, to focus myself. And then I'll, I'll ask him a question. And let me tell you, this, the Holy Spirit speaks in, in a few different ways. Uh, some people say they've heard of audible. Okay. Sometimes you hear the voice inside, but most of the time the Holy Spirit speaks in the natural flow of your of your thinking. That's why sometimes you'll think, you're like, was that me? Was that is that me really saying that, or is that God? And you kind of question that. Well, He speaks in every every moment flow of how you how you think. So I'll sit there and I'll give you an example. The very first time it happened with me, um, my two buddies who are on this journey with me. God's really speaking to them. And so I'm I'm angry. I did I did this in the hospital the night before I left. I'm like, God, I'm really angry because I'm I'm begging you. I'm talking, to you. you're you're talking to Hogan and you're talking to Fred, but you're not talking to me. And and that was my comment. And then I just shut up. And the next flow of thought was, How hard are you really trying? And I know, so I know that wasn't me because I would I'm not really good at condemning myself. <laughs> And then I started to think, you know, that's, that's right. I mean, I didn't pray in the morning, I pray at night, but, you know, if I'm starving, I'm knocking on your door until you give me something to eat. You know, how hard, how bad do you be? Like, uh, Psalm says, uh, seek my face. And, and when he hears that, he says, Jehovah, your face will I seek. That's not five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night. And so I knew that, I knew that was for what, so I'm having this. I'm having a, a conversation, and, and so that you, you need some checks and balances in this, too, because some people get weird. It's the same people who uh, uh, think the Holy Spirit throws them the ground and sticks them to the ground for five hours. I, I don't know about that yet, but I'm not going to comment on it. But so you, you hear what you hear. You write it down because it's important. Then you check it against what you know to be true. Is this consistent with Scripture? Is this consistent with God's nature? Is this consistent with my situation? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I think God's trying to talk to you. And you'll be surprised when you start to interact with the third part of the Trinity, whose job is to point to the Son of God who saved you, and then he points to the will of God that he has for your life. It's amazing how they all interact. So my goal for you this morning was not just to, well, was really just to say thank you for your prayers, to learn from uh, maybe my journey, and to access the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because I think, um, so bring the life, the bring the life came from Ezekiel 37, 30, 37, 37, where in the valley of the dry bones, where God takes Ezekiel out and says, the, the dry bones, then he asks, 
Ezekiel question. And these bones come to life. I don't know about you, but I hate when God asks me. I like asking him the questions. I don't like when he asks me. And so Ezekiel does a good end around it. He says, well, Lord, you're sovereign. You know. And then God said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to speak to these bones and tell them to come to life. Then God did it. God said, I want you to speak to the bones, tell them to come to life, put skin around them, uh, yada, yada. Nothing happened. So then Ezekiel says the exact same words. Bones come together and the skin comes together. You heard the rattling of the bones, which tells me, which told us, that there are certain things in human history that God wants humans to do. He wants to partner with us. And we can't do that when we're void of the power source, which is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So then these bones come together and the skin comes around them. And then Ezekiel says, yeah, but it has, it has no life. It has no life. So then God told Ezekiel, you pray to the spirit, the ruach, the, the, the life and the wind and the spirit. And it said the spirit came in and filled them. And then, I mean, that would have been a good ending right there. Could have ended right there. I'm like, what a great chapter. But the next verse says, and these dead bones became a vast army. And I, it's been our opinion since we started Breathing Life Ministries that God is in the business of raising up an army of, of people who were complacent church sitters, professional audience, as we watch the professional speakers. And that's never been that's never been the design from the beginning. He's created an army, and it's going to be guys like you who say, fill me, Holy Spirit, and be careful what you wish for, because it, it's a it's a powerful thing. So you got you have some sheets. I want you to get in groups of four or five and uh, work through and be honest with this because um, it's important that you check yourself. Like I said, this is a good litmus test for where you are and a good fact checker for the progress you're gonna make. So you guys have the sheets? Yeah, I even ended early. I don't do that. That's weird. Early. Yeah, 12 minutes. Okay, I, I, wait, now I'm going system then. That's good. <laughs> I feel better. I feel better. Bring it all the way. Now, so you got the sheets? Let's do those real quick and then we'll let LJ finish it out. Thanks, guys.